Welcome, everybody. My name is Justin Rood. I'm the director of the Congressional Oversight Initiative here at POGO. I'm moderating today's session. Uh, like many of you, I'm sure I'm also the parent of a young child, so we may have a surprise guest at some point. <laughs> but uh, my fingers are crossed that that you're, I'm the only one you guys will see on my end today. Um, for those of you who are familiar with our in-person trainings, the rules for these online sessions are the same. Uh, it's open to congressional staff, regardless of party, chamber, uh, or position, uh, including GAO and CRS. We are nonpartisan. We are non-hierarchical. Our interest here is making sure you all get the best information you need to do the best job possible overseeing the federal government. Today's topic is reporting requirements of the CARES Act. It's a Congress-focused overview of the data you are supposed to have access to according to the CARES Act that you passed. We'll also cover some of the problems that we're seeing with access to that data as well, because as you probably know, it hasn't been so much of a smooth ride. This event is also part of our virtual oversight summit. The summit was originally planned as an in-person conference in the fall, but instead we've been holding virtual events throughout the year, given the COVID pandemic. We'll be featuring POGO experts like Liz and Sean here with us today, as well as other good government partners. Um, these are to engage the oversight community at large, and particularly you folks in Congress on some of the really serious challenges we face at this moment. The in-person summit is gonna be uh, in the spring of 2021. Um, we are on a different platform than folks use every day. Um, it's different from Zoom in some key ways, but it's like it in others. Um, first, you'll only be seeing us. Uh, you are not visible, nor can anyone hear you. Um, if you'd like to participate or contribute, there is a chat window. We also have an ask a question feature. Uh, you can That's the best place to put questions because everyone can see them and they can also vote them up if it's a question that many people have. We'll be monitoring that and we'll be using those Q and A's, or excuse me, those questions for a Q and A portion at the end of the session. Excuse me. <clears throat> this session will be um, recorded and posted online, but we'll only be posting the uh, presentation portion by Liz and Sean. The Q and A portion will not be. Um, that's to try to create an environment where um, you all in the audience feel comfortable asking your questions, um, and this won't somehow um, be kept as any sort of a record. Um, so without further ado, I want to get to our presenters today. Uh, Elizabeth Hempowitz, Liz, uh, is POGO's Director of Public Policy. She coordinates POGO's broad advocacy portfolio and communicates POGO's priority to stakeholders, uh, including lawmakers, executive officials, the media, and our civil society partners. She's a graduate of American University's Washington College of Law and the University of Bridgeport. Welcome, Liz. We're also joined by Sean Moulton, who's a senior policy analyst here at POGO. He spent nearly two decades working on transparency and government accountability issues. He is one of the project leads on our COVID tracking database, which we'll be talking about today. Um, he's a 2011 inductee to the Freedom of Information Hall of Fame, which I didn't know until I was writing his introduction, uh, nor did I know that such a Hall of Fame existed, but I'm proud that I know somebody who's in it. Sean is a graduate of the University of Maryland and Albright College. I'm gonna turn everything over now to Liz and Sean. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you. We started thinking about doing this training right after. Oh. Rapidly and the recipients of that federal emergency. Hmm and also just how many jobs these programs were able to support during this time of extreme economic uncertainty. Unfortunately, within weeks of the passage of the CARES Act, the White House's Office of Management and Budget essentially nullified the reporting requirements created for recipients of these funds that would give us this information, meaning neither Congress nor the oversight bodies are receiving the quarterly reports required by law from those who receive more than $150,000 in federal aid. I'll come back to this in a second, but first wanted to explain in a little more detail what the reporting requirements created by the CARES Act are. Then Sean and I will talk a little bit about the two biggest obstacles currently preventing that reporting. And finally, Sean will take you through the limited data that we currently have access to. There are two primary reporting requirements that we're going to focus on today. Those that apply to the agencies distributing coronavirus relief funds and those that apply to recipients of those funds. But first, it's important to understand the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, or because we love a good acronym in this town, the BRAC. It's, because, it's the one oversight mechanism that was created to oversee the entire federal response to the coronavirus. 
The committee consists of 21 inspectors general tasked with preventing and detecting fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement, and mitigating major risks that cut across program and agency boundaries. At the same time, those individual inspectors general will continue overseeing their agency's programs for potential waste, fraud, and abuse, and providing recommendations to address those. For example, the Department of Labor's Inspector General has already identified steps that can be taken by the agency and Congress to decrease the potential for improper payments and fraud in the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Fund. Congress codified the, those two reporting requirements related to coronavirus funds I mentioned earlier, so that the IGs making up the PRAC would be able to access the data necessary to conduct the cross-agency, cross-program oversight it was created to do. First, agencies must submit a monthly report detailing any obligation or expenditure of over $150,000 or more to the PRAC, the Director of, the, of OMB, the Bureau of Fiscal Service in the Department of Treasury, and the appropriate congressional committees. Second, recipients of over $150,000 in CARES Act funding are required to report to the agency they received the funds from and the PRAC the total they received from the agency, the amount of those funds that were expended or obligated towards a project or activity, and a detailed list of all the projects or activities for which large covered funds were expended or obligated that should include the number of jobs retained and created using those funds. I, I just wanna repeat that last one for you now because it'll be particularly relevant in the second half of this training when Sean takes you through the data that is currently available on the use of those funds. Recipients of coronavirus funds are required to submit quarterly reports that include a detailed list of all the projects or activities for which coronavirus relief funds were expended or obligated, and that must include the number of jobs retained or created using those funds. The recipient reporting requirements apply to businesses and organizations, but not individuals, and the PRAC is required by law to post the data it receives from recipients online for the public to access. One reason we at POGO were so excited that these reporting requirements made it into the CARES Act is that in future emergencies or even in future relief packages to address the coronavirus emergency, Congress would be able to prioritize those programs that have the highest return on investment when it comes to job creation, because it would be easily, it, we would be easily able to tell which programs had been most successful at that goal. The Congress included these detailed reporting provisions in the CARES Act to ensure that the extraordinary levels of government spending of taxpayer dollars would get a higher level of transparency and accountability. Unfortunately, none of this reporting has happened yet for two reasons. The first is the implications of the Office of Management and Budget guidance I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna hand it over to Sean to explain that guidance and its effect. Thanks, Liz. Uh, so yes, uh, Shortly after, basically exactly two weeks after the CARES Act was signed, uh, the Office of Management Budget came out with their uh, guidance on reporting for the CARES Act. Um, and obviously we were uh, excited to see them move quickly on it. Uh, it's, it's the kind of action and, and that you need uh, when you're trying to stand up uh, kind of such a new and uh, expanded reporting system. As, as Liz mentioned, we saw this uh, years ago under the Recovery Act where, where we stood up again, similar kind of reporting structure. And it took a lot of, uh, a lot of guidance, repeated guidance from OMB. And so uh, we were initially very excited to see them move quickly on it. Unfortunately, uh, their conclusion uh, led to uh, far less transparency than, than we were hoping and, and less transparency than legally was required. Uh, essentially, uh, OMB, uh, stated that they believed that no new reporting uh, was necessary. They, they said specifically that uh, with minimal modifications, uh, existing reporting under uh, FAFATA and uh, Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act and the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act, the two laws that really um, under, underscore or, or, or support the uh, USA spending website and require uh, ongoing reporting of uh, of awards that with minimal modifications, those would serve um, and that they would uh, be able to, uh, they would get, quite, get all the information necessary both for the agencies and for the recipients that were required. As Liz said, the, the CARES Act envisioned two different types of reporting and uh, the OMB said uh, with some, some modifications, some improvements, the, the USA spending data will serve both purposes. 
Um, and so they, they cut off the idea that, that we would start collecting any new data from uh, agencies. And as I'll show you later uh, in, in specific detail, uh, the reality is the USA spending, as useful as that information is, and I use it quite a bit, um, it does not satisfy the requirements of the recipient reporting specifically. There is there is no jobs information. Uh, the, the descriptions of what the money is being used for is uh, is very uninformative frequently, and uh, we were we were very disappointed. <laughs> OMB has not you know modified or uh, or changed its position so far. Uh, and and so far, the PRAC nor the agencies really have made any move to start collecting that recipient reporting. Yeah. So the problems created by the head scratching OMB guidance, which, as Senator Portman put it recently, seems to contradict what the legislation clearly says, uh, were further compounded in May by a legal interpretation out of the Department of Treasury's General Counsel's Office. That legal interpretation effectively exempted more than one trillion dollars of coronavirus aid from the agency and recipient reporting required under the CARES Act. So this is in addition to that OMB guidance that cut off the recipient reporting really from happening at all. Uh, the Treasury's general counsel argued that the CARES Act recipient reporting requirements, which constitute the law's central transparency and accountability provision, do not apply to any of the pandemic relief funds the law appropriates to Treasury because the requirements and the funds are legislated in different sections of the CARES Act. While the general counsel's reading of the law may be technically accurate because of a boilerplate provision limiting the words this act as used in the CARES Act to apply only to the division of the act that the section appears in, it nevertheless appears to be contradictory to the intent of Congress. The statutory language is very clear in applying the reporting requirements to all programs funded not only by the CARES Act, but also by the two previous pieces of coronavirus relief legislation and any subsequent relief legislation. The Treasury's interpretation limits the recipient reporting requirements to the sections of the CARES Act that primarily appropriates funds to the agencies for salaries and administrative expenses, appropriations that would not be subject to these reporting requirements in the first place. If left uncorrected, the Treasury's interpretation would exclude from recipient reporting requirements some of the biggest financial relief packages passed to date, which would improperly shield them from oversight mandated by law and leave Congress in the dark about just how many jobs those various programs were able to support. Division A programs, which Treasury has interpreted as, as exempt from the requirements, include the $659 billion Paycheck Protection Program, the $500 billion infusion to the Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund to help economically distressed sectors of the economy, and the $150 billion bailout to state, tribal, and local governments. While a legislative solution to the problem caused by the Treasury's interpretation may be imminent, as long as the Office of Management and Budget maintains its direction that agencies need not collect any additional information from recipients, agencies administering these programs, the inspectors general overseeing these programs, and the lawmakers that appropriated these emergency relief funds will not be able to know exactly how, how those funds were used or how many jobs those programs were able to support. Though the reporting requirements have not yet yielded the data they should have, we appreciate that you and your bosses are likely trying to get as full a picture as possible of how these relief funds have been allocated and used to date. To help with that, I'll turn it over to Sean now to walk you through some of the best tools for you to sift through and understand the limited data we do have. Thanks. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen right now to actually take you through and show you uh, some of the live sites uh, I'm limiting uh, the the main three sites that I'm I'm focusing on are th three government sites uh, to make it the most sort of authoritative. Um, and I'll move through the first two rather quickly. They they all have pros and cons to them. Uh, and uh, you might I have it zoomed in, but you might find it uh, more useful if you uh, sort of maximize this screen so that you can see as much as you as possible. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen. And so there we go. Uh, so this first uh, site is the federal procurement data system. Um, this is uh, this is only for contracts. Uh, this is sort of the, the system that brings together contract data before it goes over to USA spending. So it is, uh, it is useful in many ways. Um, 
And one of the really interesting things they have that a lot of people don't always know about are over here in these, uh, these top requests. Uh, you'll see they have uh, specific special reports, uh, mostly around hurricanes. They use uh, these disaster codes called national interest action codes uh, to track um, uh, responses to these disasters across agencies. Uh, and they do have a COVID-19 report. Um, so uh, it's updated weekly, um, usually middle of the week, Wednesday or Thursday gets updated. Uh, so that's very useful. It's a it's basically a simple Excel spreadsheet um, that I will uh, here we go uh, show you. It's got a it's got a pretty good summary. It gives you summaries by agency, total actions, dollars spent. Uh, it gives you percentage breakdowns. You know, veteran owned businesses, and, uh, and then it also has a, another tab here at the bottom, and that will take you to. Uh, specific transactions, uh, specific agencies, uh, specific recipients uh, that allows you to now, you know, manipulate this and look through it. And as I said, it's it's very up to date. The cons uh, for for this site uh, are are pretty obvious. I mean, it's uh, there's no visualizations, there's no real interface. You have to download the data uh, and then kind of use your own Excel skills to find what it is you're looking for. Um, another thing I, I would highlight is that there are some missing fields uh, that you might get in USA spending. Not always important to everyone, but there's, uh, there's things missing like solicitation IDs, the numbers of offers uh, received for these contracts. I apologize. Um, uh, the, the highest compensated officers um, and uh, phone and phone and contact information, things like that. Uh, and so if you're looking for uh, some particular information, you, this might not uh, provide it for you. Um, so we'll move on from federal procurement data system to the PRAC, which uh, uh, Liz has already mentioned. Uh, they have a website up, it's got a lot of reports, but what I'm gonna focus on is this track the money section of the, uh, of the page. Uh, they have a simple kind of track the money uh, graphics. I think a lot of people have seen it. Uh, but they've actually started to post data, uh, specifically, uh, I think not surprisingly, the contract data. This essentially is uh, an interface for that very spreadsheet you just saw. That is the source of this data, but they have a, they have a map uh, that you can uh, drill down into uh, and uh, get uh, county level information on how much money is going where. Again, this is just contract spending uh, but it is uh, obviously, uh, it could be a little uh, glitchy at times, uh, but, and then it's got a table underneath uh, that you can use filters for. Uh, and so, you know, without downloading everything, you can start to filter for location, for industry sector, for product and service codes. Uh, I, did, I did this product and service code before. We'll see if it processes quickly. Um, and you'll see that now you have just that product and service code, which is support management other. I should have picked a more exciting one, but. Um, and then you can sort these uh, columns. I have to scroll all the way to the bottom to come over to the amounts. And then you can sort by obligation amount to see like the most expensive uh, contracts. Um, and unfortunately it reloads each time um, but again, you'll see uh, sort of the wrong direction. Uh, so you see in the negative numbers. So the downside of this, I mean, it gives you this interface, um, which is terrific and a map, but the map and the table, they're not linked. So when you do a filter, the map doesn't change. The map only displays uh, full contract spending. Uh, and as you can see, the, the table, uh, while you're able to filter it and, and sort, move around, it, it is a bit difficult and clunky to work with. Um, but it is a step up from uh, the contracts uh, available through FPDS. Uh, and so this might be something useful uh, for people to look around in, especially if you're looking for a, a particular state or district. Um, it can be a, a useful way to, to find those contract data. The other reason I wanted to talk about the PRACs second is because we expect the PRACs 
uh, availability of data to expand. Uh, and so uh, we are hopeful that they'll start bringing in other data loans assistance. Uh, as of right now, they do have under track the money, uh, a paycheck protection program data. Unfortunately, this merely takes you to uh, the Small Business Administration's download uh, page. So you can download a very, very large set of zip files uh, to look through the data yourself. Um, and uh, so hopefully they'll, they'll actually incorporate that data and other data uh, into kind of a central system. Um, the third system that I wanted to talk to you about, and I'll spend uh, more time than the other two on because it's more robust, is USA Spending. Um, USA Spending uh, is, is the premier kind of uh, spot for data uh, on uh, awards. Um, and it's, it's the same for COVID-19 right now. Um, they have added, uh, I'll go to the, the homepage real quick. They're promoting it right now that they've got this COVID-19 uh, tracking that in place. They've got uh, a, a COVID-19 spending profile uh, that you can uh, sort of scroll through and kind of see these top lists. Um, but what I'm going to do, and and I, I encourage you to look through it, but what I'm going to do is focus uh, back on the, under award search, under advanced search, uh, they also have a disaster emergency fund code that's brand new. It was never in the data before, uh, but they've incorporated it and they've got five different codes that relate to either the CARES Act or other COVID-19 spending. Uh, and so you can check one individually, or you can check this box here uh, to check all of them uh, or, or check none of them. So you can check one or you can check all of them. This is a search I've already done uh, for all of them. And you can see uh, in this table view, it's a lot. Direct payments, 4.2 million, loans, 2 million, and they're missing a lot still. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, 2,000 contracts, uh, 22,000, almost 23,000 grants. Um, and you can look at these individually. You can sort these by the columns available. Uh, th this, uh, you can also look at it over time, uh, switch it to something like months. Um, most importantly, you can use this code and you can narrow by a CFDA program. You can uh, narrow by uh, a location, a product or service code. If you're doing contracts, uh, a location, either a place of performance or recipient location. So there's a lot of ways you can narrow this. Um, you'll see you can, you can map it. Uh, you can look at uh, counties or uh, folks on this call might be most interested in congressional district breakdowns. Um, and you know, you can hover over them. There's no way to easily just kind of click through from this map, but again, you can, you can put your congressional district in, uh, to the, uh, one of the filters on the side here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to emphasize is this great, uh, little tool called categories default spot to an agency breakdown, uh, where you can see how much each of the agencies is spending. But you can change that to uh, CFDA program, considering the level of uh, assistance spending going on. This can be very interesting. Uh, coronavirus relief fund is the biggest uh, provider relief fund to healthcare providers, not surprisingly second. Uh, and, and so this can be a very interesting tool uh, and you can just page through to another set of 10 and work your way through the full list. Um, so it is very useful, broader range uh, of spending. It's got the contracts, it's got grants, it's got loans, direct assistance, uh, and it's got all these tools. Uh, so I, I do encourage people to use it. I use it quite a bit, I always have, but I do wanna take some time to emphasize the what's missing and, and what's problematic on this site uh, before I'll, I'll pause and, and open it up for questions. Uh, first big thing is there is still uh, a lot missing from USA spending. Uh, the PPP loans are not in, in USA spending. Uh, that's, that's about $670 billion. Uh, part of this is because they've changed how they're reporting it to try and withhold information. 
And so for some of the larger loans, they're reporting them in ranges and there's no way to put ranges into the loan information here. Uh, this, this requires you to put in an amount. Uh, and so this kind of unique idea that somehow they have to do something different with these PPP loans means that the data is not as usual for, for small business loans going into this system. Uh, economic impact payments, the, the $1,200 uh, that were going out to households, that's considered uh, a tax credit uh, and, you know, sort of an advance uh, payment on a tax credit. And so it, it's not assistance. And so it's not going to be in here. Unemployment insurance isn't in there yet. Provider relief fund uh, is reported in a pretty messed up way uh, that makes it very difficult to use. So it's in the system but it's a single transaction to the state of Utah where they have their, I guess, a contractor or somebody who's helping to process these provider relief fund payments. And so you, you, they have the data on what hospitals and healthcare providers are getting the money, but they're not providing it through here. You have to go to a different site, which is disappointing. Uh, Federal Reserve activities are not reported in here. Uh, and so there's still a lot missing. Uh, and then I wanted to emphasize some data quality problems and uh, uh, hopefully I'm not overwhelming you, but uh, I, I did want to point out that um, while the disaster code is, is great, uh, it, is, uh, it is new and it is uh, inconsistent in, in its coverage. Uh, they're still clearly missing some, some COVID related spending. Uh, here are some that I, I found before the, the presentation. Um, so to give you, uh, you know, a comparison, we'll come back here uh, to our data and give it a second. Um, and, uh, all right, it's gathering my data and taking way too long. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump to another award that I'm gonna use as an example later. So you'll see here's an award that's tagged with COVID-19 spending. Uh, and it's got this kind of purple COVID-19 outlay, but, uh, as I'll show you in these awards, there's no tag. Uh, here's a, uh, a cooperative agreement uh, with 3M. And down here is your description, COVID-19 DPEA, which is uh, Defense uh, Production Act, capacity expansion for US respiratory protection. This is a $57 million cooperative agreement and it's not tagged. Uh, similarly, uh, a North Carolina uh, CARES Act uh, assistance to Small Business Development Center, not tagged. Um, a loan processing for SBA assistance, they processed a lot of loans. Uh, and so they, this is a contract or uh, yeah, this is a contract, a blanket purchase agreement with highlight technologies for 36 million, not tagged. Um, so uh, I think this is the kind of thing, here's another, a purchase order agreement for PPE, COVID-19 PPE to the states, doesn't have the COVID-19 tag. So again, I, I still think, I wanna emphasize, I still think it's useful to go to this site. I think it's useful. Uh, you're getting a lot of the data uh, with the tools they're giving you, but I, I did just wanna use this as an example to let you know that it's not comprehensive yet. Uh, we are hoping that data quality will improve with these tags. Uh, but let's move on to some of the tags that are there and talk about some of the other problems uh, very briefly. Um, award descriptions. Uh, Liz emphasized that one of the things required in the CARES Act was a, a detailed description of what the funds were used for. That was one of the things we wanted recipients to tell us. And the OMB guidance claimed that uh, we would be able to, with minor modifications, get all of that information from USA Spending and here is a $5.8 billion uh, direct payment to American Airlines under the uh, pandemic relief for aviation workers. And the full description of the award is simply CARES Act. Uh, doesn't really paint a picture as to what, got, what it got used for, how many jobs it helped save. Um, and you'll start to see a trend here here is a, a federal transit formula grant to New York Metropolitan Transit Authority. Uh, it's part of the CARES Act operating, and that is pretty much the whole description. Uh, and it's a $4 billion uh, award uh, grant that 
we don't know what they're actually using it for or how many jobs it helped maintain uh, in this transit system. Here's one just to a state under the Coronavirus Relief Fund. These are major awards that went to states, 5.6 billion to Texas. And once again, simply the CARES Act under the description. Um, and we'll go with one last one. Here's a contract uh, from USDA to Winona Foods in Green Bay uh, and a, a lot of weird coding. But uh, the emphasis here is uh, a $5.4 million a contract apparently for shredded cheese, five to six pound bags or six five pound bags. Uh, again, not exactly the kind of description that lets you know really what this money went for. Um, is there other uh, food products that are being purchased? Was cheese just the biggest one? Is it just cheese? I can't tell you. Um, and these are really the, the limitations that have long as existed on USA spending. Uh, but become even uh, more uh, dramatic and more uh, frustrating when we have something like uh, the coronavirus awards that we're looking to uh, uh, find and, and track and, and hold accountable. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to emphasize, one of the things, I don't think Liz mentioned it, but the recipients were also required to report uh, any sub-awards they did. Um, this is particularly uh, important for uh, particularly big uh, contracts and grants that are going out. States uh, are going to sub a lot of that money out. Um, and so uh, that's something we're missing without getting the recipient rewards. And USA Spending does have sub award information, but, and I say this again, while patting the uh, website on the back quite a bit for what it gives me, the, the sub award data is unreliable to the point of being practically useless at this point. Uh, it varies from containing no information on awards uh, when you know that there would be sub-awards, say from a state, to having more information, more spending subbed out than the, the full uh, award was, prime award was worth. So here you'll see that I have this, this is a toggle. Whenever you do a, a search, you can, it starts at prime, but you can switch to sub-awards. And so this is just a search for all COVID-19 spending for, for this fiscal year. Um, and here are some of these sub-awards you see. And I've pulled up some of the uh, awards. Uh, and so here's the, here's the largest one. This is to the sub-award Chase County Hospital Foundation. And so when you come out here, you go up to the main award, which is to the Nebraska uh, HHS uh, department. Uh, and it's a coronavirus, makes sense. Here's the full award. 4.5 million, but as you scroll down and go over to these sub-awards, you'll see that the sub-awards total 971 million with a, a main award of 5.4 million. Uh, and so that's impossible. Uh, and you can see that as soon as you sort by amount these sub-awards, um, you can see that there's an award, the one that we found for Chase, that makes no sense. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a tremendously huge award. Uh, that's there's got to be an error there. Um, here's the the second award uh, from that from that same table of sub awards. So this is for Rolling Plains Management. The main award was to uh, uh, Texas Housing and Community Affairs, and you'll see the the prime award, forty eight million. And as you scroll down and come to this sub awards, once again, we have a uh, another prime, another sub award that makes no sense relative to the uh, the amount of the prime award. And so, uh, again, this is something we would have gotten under what CARES Act is acquiring, and we're not getting it. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Um, I'm happy to take questions on on any of this to talk about how, how to do things. Um, the other thing I wanted to emphasize, uh, I, I was actually hoping that we would have our, uh, our tracker, Pogo's uh, COVID-19 tracker launched uh, this week, and we would be able to kind of premiere it for you. We've had a, a few minor delays, but we do expect it to launch uh, uh, in probably um, 
probably not next week, but the week after, uh, before the end of the month, uh, we will be launching our tracker and we'll be trying our best to uh, pull together as a broad an array of data as we can, um, pulling in all the stuff that, that is out there that's still missing from USA spending, the PPP loans, the economic impact payments, uh, trying to break up the provider relief fund, the Federal Reserve activities. Uh, and we're going to be developing that out uh, over the, the next month or two to include uh, overlays with uh, other maps like um, uh, population. So we could do it by per capita, uh, you know, unemployment rates uh, in, in states and counties uh, to see if, if the money that we're spending to try and help with employment is going to where unemployment is highest. Uh, and so we have a lot of plans for it. Uh, I wish I could uh, show it to you. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have it ready yet, uh, but uh, please be looking for uh, a message from us in the next uh, week or so. And uh, uh, we will be uh, announcing it as soon as it's ready uh, and would, would love for people to use it, tell us what they think, what they, what's missing from it, what would be helpful. Uh, it's gonna be an iterative process uh, and we're very open to building the tools that are going to be useful in creating oversight. Um, and I think I will pause there. I know I've been talking for quite a bit just now uh, and see uh, see what uh, questions we might have um, and see if uh, Liz wants to rejoin me. I've rejoined. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the risk of belaboring the point that we've been making this whole time, I just want to end on the note that um, since this is, since this whole presentation is about the reporting requirements of the CARES Act, it is as if those reporting requirements were not included in the law right now, given the data that we are receiving. Uh, so just just want to make that point that the that the specific reporting about how the tremendous amount of federal dollars that we have been spending incredibly quickly, uh, the reporting meant to ensure that the inspectors general have the data they need to do their jobs, uh, the reporting required to uh, to allow Congress to uh, gauge the efficacy of these programs at their stated goals, we're not getting any of that information and we won't get it unless both of these issues are addressed, the OMB guidance and the Treasury's interpretation that is limited, really greatly limited uh, what these reporting requirements would even apply to. Well, I want to remind folks also that um, uh, while Sean and Liz uh, represent two of our best and finest uh, soldiers working on oversight issues related to the pandemic and the federal response to the pandemic, um, Pogo has a number of other things, uh, irons in the fire, um, working on this. Sean's mentioned the tracker, which we're hoping to see live in the next couple of weeks. We have a new uh, weekly newsletter called Corrupted, um, covering the COVID response and the various problems and, and areas of potential corruption that we're seeing cropping up. Uh, and Pogo, as some of you know, does its own oversight and independent investigations. We've already published a number of investigations based on some of this data and analysis that we've been able to do. You can find that all on our website and we post about it on social media as well if you follow Pogo on Twitter and Facebook and, and elsewhere. I want to give just a moment in case there are any last questions that folks haven't had a chance to ask um, and we can um, see if there are any others. I don't want to leave anybody without an answer. Well, please feel free to reach out to us individually after. I'm going to put my email in here as well. Um, we are here uh, to help you. Our job is to make you as smart and as powerful and as great as, as you need to be. Um, so please don't be uh, hesitant to reach out if there are any questions you have or any way that you think we could assist you in your work. Um, uh, Liz or Sean, do you have any parting thoughts or comments? No, feel free to feel free to reach out to us. Please don't let our weird obsession with these uh, reporting requirements and the data about this spending go to waste. Uh, I will. I will just say that despite my emphasis uh, and, and focus on some of the negatives, uh, you know, we are data is improving. We're getting more of it. Uh, uh, I'm hopeful that USA spending will continue to improve. That the the PRAC website will, as I said earlier, will start to draw in a lot. And again, our, our, our POGO tracker, we are endeavoring to kind of build something that will be as comprehensive uh, and as, as functional as possible. And so uh, if, if this is something you're looking into, uh, just because I've said a lot of negative things or pointed out a lot of the flaws, 
do not despair. It's continuing to get better. And we have to use the data that we have available and, and create as much oversight uh, as possible. Great, great. Thank you both for being with us, for doing this session. I want to thank everybody who attended um, and asked questions um, and uh, did the hard work up on Capitol Hill to get these requirements in law and hopefully hold folks' feet to the fire and make sure that all Americans have access to the information to help them understand where all of this money is going. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Justin. Thanks.